has tried to introduce a bill that would make crimes against LGBT people fine, hate crimes, get out jail free card if they were found to be doing lascivious behavior. Okay. He so is, do that. yeah, that's a technical Texan. term for him. Every, everything he's wrong on, like marijuana reform, everything. So I'm running for Congress this year. Yeah. yeah. And I hope you'll support my campaign. She's right here. I'll be like the congresswoman of this hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is James A. Moore. Uh, you can call me Jim. I've written for I've written many, many novels now, about 40 of them. But before I did the novels, I did everything for White Wolf Games. Uh, Vampire the Masquerade, Girl of the Apocalypse, Changeling, Mage, the whole nine yards. Including some of the stuff for Werewolf Wild West and for the Changeling East. My elder daughter wants to meet you. <laughs> By God, I'm here. <laughs> Sadly, she's in the but it's, uh, I, I absolutely love doing role-playing games. But at some point I said, maybe it'd be cool if I was writing my own stuff. <laughs> and actually just last year, Dragon Con, they did the 25th anniversary of White Wolf, which was kind of a kick in the, in the pants. I'm like, crap, I'm old. <laughs> you look 30 to me, just so you know. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe Bo 25. Bo yeah, Bo Hair. <laughs> um, I'm Erin Hartshorn, and I actually have no game design experience. I'm looking at um, some interactive fiction, um, like choice of games right now, but I haven't done any. Most of my ideas on what makes something interesting and playable comes from playing a lot of games. Amen to that. <laughs> Somebody's got to buy them. <laughs> Ironically, I knew a Jennifer Hartshorn, who was one of my uh, directors down at Wolf. She stabbed me in the hand once. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that. <laughs> and just for the record, I'm Steve Kellner. I'm the moderator. I'm a motivational psychologist by training and um, uh, management consultant by day. And I'm an amateur of game design. I've designed RPGs, LARPs, way back with the Society of Interactive Literature rings any bells, mm -hmm. and business simulations. But uh, my intent is to focus on you guys. So, but just, you know, I think I'll understand what you may be saying once in a while. Okay. I was wondering why I felt so motivated on this panel. Yes. <laughs> it's job. what I do. Yeah. Right. So, the first place about where to start, since it's clearly designed to be kind of a how-to panel, is where do you start? Where, what are the components that you need to build a game? So, I, I want to tell people out there, making a game is so much harder than you think it oh, is. Oh, dear Christ, yes. And it is, it is a real profession, and I really wish more people understood this, that game design is a swear-to-God talent in professional subspecialties. The press all the time writes about me and says, Brianna, we game designer. And I'm like, no, I don't want that job. That's a terrible <laughs> job. I will get the capital to make the games, but game design is a very specific subspecialty. And it is, you know, it is, we all have ideas if we love games, right? That's why we get into this field. But actual game design, like if you ask yourself why games got so much better technically between the NES and the SNES, it's because we learned a lot about gameplay science and the actual like principles behind us. So maybe there are people here that can speak more to it than I can, but like good game design is playtesting, it is iterative, it is being ruthless about throwing things away that don't work, and it's hard. And it's, it's, and it's yeah. microscopic. Please, please. That's yes. the thing. It's like, it's like everything has to be fun down to the molecular level. And so you mentioned like the yeah. NES, and that reminds me of um, uh, you know, the Mario games. And one of the discoveries that they made in the Mario games when they simplified from the American style six button games like Asteroids and things like that down to one joystick and one button, they had to make that one button interesting. And one of the ways that they did that is by making the jump variable by how long you held it down, which is super intuitive and added all sorts of dimension to the gameplay. But that came in later iterative design. But it's sort of like, you know, instead of doing this, you do this or this. And all of a sudden, explosion happens. And so this is the sort of thing that you can't predict. You can only do it through iteration. And that's one of the things that makes it really hard because ideas, just like in fiction, and I think we're, we're coming to an audience with a lot of readers, you know, having the idea for a good book is nothing like actually putting in the thousand hours it takes to actually write 
you know, one book and then times that by 40 and you have a career like this, right? So, you know, that, that, that's the thing. It's like it's so small and it's so difficult and you need so much input to do it. So that's what, that's what I would add. Well, it's, it's an interesting challenge to read across the board. One of the things that people don't realize about role-playing games and, and games in general is that there's a deadline. Mm. <laughs> and when I say that, for role-playing games, they go, yeah, you're a little late, and we're going to get annoyed in about another month. And when you're talking about video games, they're going, well, you're late, and we're going to have your family killed. <laughs> because there's millions and millions of dollars waiting for this to get done. I can confirm that's true. <laughs> 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 you can't confirm. <laughs> Seriously. Well, yeah. One of my friends... <laughs> One of the guys that used to be one of my one of my editors at White Wolf Games is a gentleman by the name of Richard Dansky. And Rich takes care of, well, pardon my language, goddamn near everything at Red Storm Games. Uh, he's actually their, their, their go-to Top Gun troubleshooter. So if something's not been working out in France, he goes to France to fix the problems. He has stress levels that nobody could possibly understand, but he hasn't dropped a heart attack, it never ceases to amaze me. On the other hand, he made enough money in two years to buy his house with cash, so it all depends on what you're doing in this world or what you're looking for in this world. Rich is easily one of the most intelligent men I've ever known, and he still has no clue what the hell's going on in <laughs> And he's been doing it for 25 years in, in the video games. He is in charge of all of the Tom Clancy video games. Yeah. Uh, oh. So, I mean, if we, if we can get down to, like, nitty-gritty, something I really believe is if you're going to start making a game, I think you have two options. I think you can look at other games that are out there that you like and appreciate, and I think you can kind of refine those mechanics or tweak those mechanics or kind of move it a bit towards you. And even with that, you're going to need a lot of, um, you know, of your own play testing. But I also think that I'm a big believer in our studio of uh, the, the process of iterative design. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, people don't know this, but games look like garbage until like a week before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is so true. Like, you'll have the interfaces that you drew on a napkin and just scan into the game. So, iterative design, like, you can do it with, you can do it with PowerPoint presentations. You can do it with, I can, I've hacked it together, like, with, a, you know, Flash. I, you can, and the idea is not for it to be, really playable is to get the nuts and bolts there to go like is this fun does this work and then you put it in front of people and just hand it to them and see if they can figure it out on their own and you have to keep your mouth shut and that's so hard for me <laughs> but I, I really do believe that that kind of iterative design that is the difference in a good game and a great game so i think you raised two different points here though that i want to make sure i separate yeah one is, it doesn't have to be perfect the first time out, which is true of any creative yep. endeavor. Only the last draft matters. Two is that you have to assume it's going to suck at some point. And the only way you can fix that is by testing it. Yep. And with games, you have actually you have an audience to do it. With writers, you have people who go do writer's workshops. But, but it's like there is no designing the perfect game out of the box. Really? You're, you're out to find the fun. I mean, and so... You know, I think it's a great idea to take something that exists and just try to refine a little bit to see if you can make it more fun because a lot of times we'll play a game and say like, you know, they should have done this little thing. And then you make that game and you discover, first of all, why they didn't do that thing and you're an idiot for even proposing it. But then, <laughs> six months later, you might figure out why. The other thing I want to build on too yeah. is almost all games, I mean, pretty much all games start as paper, even if they're video games. You know, mm -hmm. they start on paper and you only add... Uh, difficulty of, of medium as you need it. So you'll, if you're making a video game at some point, if it's a real-time game, you're gonna have to make a flash prototype or something because you have to see things in action. And that's a calculus problem that's hard to duplicate on paper. But almost all games that I've seen, whether video or whatever, have started with very simple elements. Uh, I'm part of the Board Game Designers Forum in New York City, and so you know we have a lot of professionals, people from NYU and the New School, who come in, and sometimes they have made the the updates to their prototypes, you know, on, on pieces of paper that they were tearing up on the subway there because as they were, you know, looking over last week's notes or whatever, that's the time that you do it, and then you just throw it in front of people and you find the fun. And, and it is very interesting to think about how, how little you know about fun. You know, how little you know about what, what it is that actually you know, will set the chemicals in your brains going off. And, and, and that's where the magic happens and the, the numinous quality is, is discovered. <laughs> I'm just sitting here learning. <laughs> well, let's put it a different way. Yeah. A 
I mean, have you, yeah, what do you like about a game? And what makes it fun? I mean, we think it's fine and good to talk about magic, but I think people here want to figure out, well, how do you make the magic happen, yeah. right? Yeah. What are the spells? I have a really good example of this, actually. Um, so for our last game of the week, we brought out uh, Carolyn Van Esselton. I think she's here this weekend. You know, she sat down and we programmed this, um, this sub-menu into our battle engine. And we give you all these questions after every single fight you went through. Like, well, did you feel like the enemy health was too high or too low? You know, was the fight too long? Like, how did you feel about A, B, or C? What would you rate it? And you said at the very beginning of this that game design was a very micromanaging process, and it is. It's all spreadsheets, and people don't know that because you are literally getting playtesting data, and then you'll go into the Excel spreadsheet, and then you change your variables. You change health, you change recovery time, you change stun lock, and then you put it out for another playtesting cohort. That is how you make a good game, and it is so boring to do. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely true, by the way, in role-playing games. Yeah. Uh, well, one of my favorite examples of that was I, I had a group of victims that I called the, the troop that I played with, where I got to basically destroy their lives regularly while I was testing my games. They're fine and profit. Absolutely. So I've come up with this idea, and we're just going to rip your little souls out and stomp on them for a while. And I played one of the games that, that White Wolf had actually set up, and it was uh, Diablo Mexico. Statistically speaking, if you played this game and you tried to kill off the bad, the bad guy and drain all of his power, you were going to die a horrible, horrible death. It's all there is to it. It was designed so that you could not possibly survive this. This was the idea of just a delightful time. And then, a roll of the dice. And the big bad guy who should have been impossible to destroy botched the roll and died horribly and was sucked up by all of the people. And Andrew Greenberg was the developer at the time. And I told Andrew what happened and he went, what the hell did you do? I said, I followed the rules. She said, don't follow the rules. Follow <laughs> <Tell> them. <laughs> the guy explained what had happened and he changed the rules for the game for the next edition. What happened basically was he botched it and a, a nobody basically mind controlled the big bad guy who's waking up and said, go back to sleep. And he went back to sleep and they drank him. He sucked all the blood and the soul right out of the dude. And he said, well, from now on, that's never going to happen. Now, from now on, unless you have a higher rank than this guy. But you can't you can't use that power on him anymore because I said so. And he put it in the rules and there it was. And this is play testing. Yep. I and remember. In this case the book had actually come out and he was reading this. <laughs> <laughs> For those of us who have been old AD and D players, I remember oh, yeah. get stuff out of the drag and you'd realize this stuff is really not play testing. Yeah. Oh yeah. My, one of my favorite examples of this was actually Kentrick. Yes. Where it was basically a quarter of a first level spell and there were things like Lighting a candle on fire. Just useful things for around the house. I had players use nothing but cantrips and annihilate high-level characters. Yes. I'll put flame on his eyes. You know, I'll put, <laughs> clean up the dust and throw it in his nose. You know, I mean, I'll change his clothes so he's now wearing something that's very binding. You know what I mean? I have summoned rats and he's covered with food, so. Yeah. <laughs> so you get this really hits the, the problem that when you are making a video game, you were sitting there and you're looking at code for 40 hours a week, you're working mm -hmm. on textures, you're working on game mechanics, and you really get to the point where you cannot see the forest for the trees. You have no idea how people are going to perceive it because you're playing it and you're thinking, okay, my frames are four seconds there, I've got to interpolate this animation differently, I need more memory there. You were thinking about all this high level stuff and you just, you can't ever know how they're going to perceive it. So you have to throw it in front of an audience because they have this fresh eye that you utterly lose while you're working. So let's talk, but let's talk about yeah, that. I mean, yeah. I mean, you always start with something, though, sure. that you expect is fun before you get lost in right. the trees. Yep. Yeah. What are the kind of things you try to get a pe person to experience? So, so you, you do it for yourself. So, you know, writers always say, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. You know, that's a, that's a good maxim to live by. And it's kind of the same thing. And so you should be thinking about what you want to experience in a game that's sort of like missing from the universe right now. And actually, I'm glad that you two are sort of like opposite of each other because when you're talking about role playing, you're talking about changing rules on the fly, a play Ooh, experience. 
you know, uh, you know modifier. There's a moderator role. who manages the process. Yeah, like right? a, somebody who basically adjudicates the rules. And when you have a justiciar, you don't need an AI in the same kind of way. Whereas your system has to be prepackaged and done to the nth degree, or at least as much as you can afford, right? And so that, that's where, you know, it, it's a very different type of design, even in philosophy, you know? And so when I make games for the classroom, for instance, I know I'm gonna be there and I can be an adjudicator, and that lets me not make video games for the right. classroom because it's prohibitively expensive and it might not function even you know, the best of circumstances. So I tend to do paper things in, in the classroom. So I think when you start is you say, here are things that I think would be really enjoyable in the setting. Here's the, here's the thing I want to capture. For example? For example, uh, this game is because I am addicted to hot peppers. I love, love hot peppers. I embarrassed myself in San Antonio, Texas by trying to eat the four horsemen of the apocalypse burger oh. and failing. Those of you who've seen man versus food, they cheated now. It used to be three butchalokias, now it's six and it's drenched Ooh. in habanero pepper sauce like crawls down your throat and closes it before it. Well, so, so this is the fun. <laughs> so the fun is the endorphin rush. Yeah. Yeah. Having your throat try and burn itself out. But the fun here is pressing your luck. And so when I tried to make the game at uh, first, I was like, oh, you want to keep yourself balanced so you don't burn. But that's balance isn't fun when you're eating peppers. Ultimate destruction is shot in for it. And that's what's fun. So it's just like a. Uh, uh, going to the, the brinksmanship sort of game, except exactly. you're testing yourself and seeing if you can force someone else over the edge. Yeah, exactly. You're sort of well. What it is is sort of like if, if you explode in a blaze of glory, that's worth points. But ah. if you explode too soon, you, you're out before you can do it. So it's like knowing when to destroy yourself. It reminds me of the game Nuclear War, where the idea is to be the last one to blow everything. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> kind of the same thing. I think, you, I you need think to have a sneeze cool. card in there, by the way. So they can sneeze oh. the pepper into their nose. <laughs> <laughs> Because I saw somebody do that once, and it was freaking hilarious. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't laughing. Was right. They were nice to you. You were cracking it. Okay, so that's. Yeah. So that's I, the I think I think good games have a good mix of risk and reward. I think that is a really essential component of a game. But I also think, and I think this really applies to board games, like all respect to those of you that like board games, a reason I find it difficult to get into is because the rules are generally very Byzantine and impenetrable. <laughs> and I think that I-, I Monopoly? Not, not, monopoly would be accessible, I would say. But I think there's, I think a really good element of, um, of really well-designed games is if someone can pick it up and play it, I think you've succeeded as a, as a part of game design. If someone's having to go to an FAQ or read another site to figure out how to play a game, I think that's I a very niche product, and I think, I think you failed as a game designer, unless it's something like Dark Souls, where the entire <laughs> point of it is designed for No, but we have to so, our player on the so, so something like Flux, by your, by, by your definition, is an absolutely perfect game. I don't know what it is. Flux is this card game where basically Anyone. the rules are you draw a card, you play a card. No. And the rules are not. And, 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 and if somebody wants to join in in the middle of the hand, they sit down, they draw, they draw a card, and they play. I would say, I mean, I'm talking about the video game industry. Right. Okay. The video game industry is dominated by older white men. And mm -hmm. it's people that have grown up with they're very comfortable with the button, with the joystick, with two sticks and 12 buttons on it. Right. I think very often we have a game design problem where you're assuming people know how to do this, and I know how to play that. Right. But my, a lot of people are trying to use an Xbox controller, the slash gear. Well, <laughs> it, more, more people play casual games right. than anything else. Right. And most of those, that audience, are, is female. Uh, what? It's, it's close, it's close. close. Um, yeah, the majority, I mean, I like the majority yeah. Like Diablo 3 is good because it, slow, it yes. slowly adds in which buttons you're using uh, as you go through. Diablo 3 is a real, I would call this not perfect, but close to perfect <coughs> game design. Because at its core, Diablo 3 is about clicking to kill stuff, right? right? But then we learn how to pull these different weapon slots, and there's a lot of accessibility there. But there's it, a it's so level. slow that you go through and exactly. add the buttons exactly. that you learn it. And so yeah. let, let's lay this down as a general principle. Right. It should be accessible at least to start with, and either stays accessible or it teaches you 
at a reasonable pace. Yeah. yeah. Except when it doesn't. You know, and so just like the art world, <laughs> right. as soon as you make you know a rule, the the exceptions flood in. I'm thinking yep. of the gorgeous ugliness of Dwarf Fortress, for instance. <laughs> and Dwarf Fortress is an ASCII game, an ASCII game, and it is maybe the most complicated simulation ever created, but it is so complicated that it creates, it basically what you're doing is you have a kingdom of dwarves who will do just about everything you can imagine to fuck up their lives. Forgive my language, I, this is the nice night. Is my daughter's right there. Sorry. Right. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Right. So, you know, we have a psychologist here in the building. So Dwarf Fortress is so complicated because it's so graphically light that it allows things, for instance, for a king to be cursed by the thing that he wanted to do. And so like I was reading online on Reddit about this, this dwarven king who was immune to fire. Uh, but he wasn't immune to pain, which is a different stat in the game. And so he caught fire and just stayed on fire for like 500 years, went insane, and wrecked his entire kingdom as he ran all around it spot by spot and set the whole mountain ablaze. That kind of gorgeousness is impossible in Diablo 3, you know? And so that, that's where it's sort of like, the what is, and, wow. and, and Diablo 3 is, is, is a good game too. It's not that it's not. It's more like Dwarven Fortress is absolutely a niche work of art that not a lot of people can play, but it creates these sort of opportunities that, that don't exist in any other any other. So game. now we're talking about the idea of rules versus flexibility. We've come up with that in terms of role-playing games where you could have a somewhat infinite possibility to play. Oh, you've got dear God, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure we can tell stories. Wanna... I'll, I'll, I'll throw a couple of your way. First off, the best rule that ever came out of White Wolf Games was the Golden Rule. Yeah. And the Golden mm -hmm. Rule said, whatever rules exist, the storyteller, the guy in charge of the game, can supersede them. <coughs> ah, lovely concept. Ended every argument to say, I am a rules nut, so I'm gonna pull out the 17 books that say, and you go, no, golden rule, screw you, I'm in charge. <laughs> um, I've also seen that badly abused by incompetent game masters yeah. who were too stupid to come up with a game worth playing. Which so. is true. Uh, one of the problems with variables is, no matter how many variables you have, and they want you to limit it to the most common variables on a role-playing game. Some people come up with something that is completely Possibly stupid. <laughs> I did that in Champions when I had a character haul off and kiss another character in the middle of a fight. Oh, yeah. And of course, the character freaked out, and that's when everybody else dogpiled on and beat the crap out of the bad guy. <laughs> and looked at my, my character a little funny afterwards, but hey, it worked. Uh, <laughs> my, my wife, by the way, was a, a master of completely throwing me off. Yeah, yeah. Because she was brilliant. She would come up with a solution no one else would have thought of. And you did slap yourself. At the, but, but I enjoyed that because yeah. what an RPG is about is the mutual creation of a story. Exactly. And that's not something, it, it, it's more, you, you're doing a little of that with a good video. Well, you know? so the video games, good rule sets encourage you to find the edges of it. Right? Yeah. Like Which Grand is kind of what you're talking about, too. Like Grand Theft Auto. Um, yeah, this is a game I would say is a really good example of this because it kind of encourages you to go out and see what kind of violence you can do. Horrible, horrible, horrible things. I don't play this game. Yeah. I don't play this game. Actually, it's, a, it's a good example of finding the edges. It's a great film. Yeah. Uh, Travis Williams was one of the designers on the original Grand Theft Auto, and he also used to work at Red Wolf Games. Uh, right. uh, and he, he said to, to several people at the convention, don't, don't let your kids play this. Yeah. And this was on the first edition. They said, why not? I said, because I've, I've designed a game for you where when you've had a bad day at work, you can cut loose with some road rage and do horrible things to horrible people. You don't want your kid playing this. <laughs> you know, and later editions were, hey, why don't you just slap that whore around for a while? Because um, you were saying, so where did the edges of the game, of that game for you? I mean, I'm saying this is a good principle of game design. It's for, you know, what rules you can get away with. Like yeah. how far you can push different principles, and maybe it's you know, Frog Fractions is a really good example of a game that kind of yeah. sub subverts your expectations. So this is a game that it starts off and you're just shooting your tongue in the air and trying to do some math problems. It turns out to just be this completely ridiculous esoteric story. You have to figure out that your frog needs to go in the pond and go under the water. And the moment where you figure that out and do it and go through this completely weird narrative is the reason it won so many game designs. Um, so, you know, it's it's finding that edge is yeah. very important. I knew someone who played Han Solo Asteroids. He would dodge as long as he could. Oh, yeah. right. And, you know, I mean, that was sort of a totally different game. And it was hard, but it was a very different game than the one that was designed. Uh, one of my co-authors and friends actually has been playing Lord of the Rings 
MMO since it came out. And one of the things he's discovered is if you turn your character just the right way and move them sideways, you can go into areas of the game that don't exist yet. <laughs> yeah, see. It's a bounding box error. Yeah. Those yeah. are yeah. easy. It, it, Those are hard to find. He just has fun yeah. doing screen caps every time he goes to an area that shouldn't exist. Right. It's a bouncing block. Sorry. <laughs> 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 I can't even call it a yeah. So, Aaron, do you like playing at the edges of games? Um, or do you like playing in the middle? I, I don't know. I think I take more towards the middle. Um, I. <laughs> Oh. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's something to be said. That if there's no good middle, there's no point in having a great edge. Right, right. right. Yeah. I mean, you know, but for, that's well, the same yacht. But well, I mean, role playing games is always that one player who has to try to find a way to throw a monkey wrench in there. Yeah. The question is whether they're doing it maliciously or with style. Oh, with style, yeah. nine times out of ten. But, you know, in the middle of the great combat, I'm going to tickle him. Yeah. <laughs> well, shit. It doesn't say if the character's ticklish. <laughs> Roll! It's exactly what you asked for. I rolled it. Congratulations, he's ticklish. But this is where we come to the risk and reward point, too. And the idea that there's a, a chance that the impossible can happen is, I think, is what motivates people. Right. So, but the question is, what kind of game is there? Why do people gamble when the odds are so high against them? And actually, I do have an answer to that because I'm a psychologist. <laughs> high risk, high reward is appealing to certain people. Maximizing performance is something that different people like, and I think it explains why some there are different games for different people. Well, it's different roles, right? Like uh, an utterly legitimate uh, play, test, play style is what we call glass cannon, where you like min-max your offensiveness and then leave your defense at minimum, and then you play through a game and you're killing everything in sight, but one hit is going to kill you. Yeah. That is a valid play style. Absolutely. Another valid play style is to kind of balance your points around so you can take more hits, be more strategic, Good games allow for a variety of different players. Right. Bad games kind of lock you into A, B, or C. This is why Overwatch is such an interesting game design, because it does have those heroes that kind of fit that twitch, move, kill, got a mouse over to that exact pixel and hit it every time. There are characters in that game for that, but there are also roles for lower skilled players to just kind of follow people around and heal them, and that is good game design. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, there, there are a couple different things to factor out. Some, some games have no chance to them, right? So chess is a perfect information game, and you yep. know exactly which moves you have. And so this is a game that doesn't rely on anything other than previous knowledge of the game and understanding the, the rules of the game, you know, and... And being able to actually to calculate possible moves X moves out if you're really an expert. It's, 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 but calculating moves out is, is overrated. That's, that's how computers do it. It's much more having a sort of, like, sense of like, here's where I generally want to be, and, and knowing this move and having a history of it is more how humans play. Sure, yeah. conceptual analysis. Yeah, it's more like a conceptual zeitgeist idea. So, you know, to me it's sort of like, Overwatch is actually a great example because what it does is it plays to different play styles, but all of those players have meaningful choices to yes. make within their thing. And that meaningful choice, I think, is one of the watchwords. It's like, when, you, when you're in a position, if you don't have a meaningful choice, then you don't know what to do, or you know exactly what to do, and either of those is terrible. So in the role-playing game, for instance, part of the fun is trying to break the, the DM. I'm sorry, that's like, that, <laughs> yes. that is a, a universal, yeah. yeah, I mean, that, that is like, that is part of the, the game, and maybe, maybe you'd call it metagame, I don't know, but, but to me it's like, I think it's just part of the game, just trying to mess with the people in front of you, just like, just like, you know, improv actors do when they yeah. give somebody an especially hard prompt because they think it's funny, you know, and so, but that's still a meaningful choice, and to me it's sort of like, instead of being like, well, shit, it's more like, well, shit, here we go, you know, and like, that, that's the time to level up as a, as a DM, even. And, and so you drew a line in the sand. Yeah. Now I gotta draw my own line. Right. right. Do your line with a two by four. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, then it becomes, I mean, the challenge of RPGs is, I think there is, I mean, I, I always play not as a, to kill my players. In fact, my objective is the risk-reward thing was, I wanted everyone to feel that they were in mortal peril, mm -hmm. peril at every minute and nobody died. <laughs> and that's what happened. They pushed it as hard as they could, because the trouble with the role-playing game when you're a game master is, you can kill anybody at any moment. Meteor just fell, you're dead. <laughs> So the constraints are the ones you put on yourself, and so the, like, there's there's a phenomenon we know. Sorry, sorry, dropping into motivation again. But the balance of challenge and ability is what leads to flow experience. 
if you know the Haley Chicks and the Haley stuff. Yeah. It took me four months to learn how to pronounce that name. So, but it also is about games. When you get totally wired and you're on it, it's because of that perfect balance. It's just challenging enough to fully engage you. Can I borrow your pen for a second? So you talked about psychology. One of the more interesting charts I saw of game design was like this. So there are different points that people play at. There are different psychological reasons that people have for play. So part of the old style where industry started where it was just old white dudes in our field, you know, this get a high score. That is yeah. like a very big psychological motivator for it, which is why so many games in the 80s like have that high score mechanic. That well, was well, it goes back to pinball games. That's, that's enough, but pinballs are about figuring out the rules and figuring out creative ways to get around those. Yeah, but you're also aiming for the high score. So then you see, like, there's this other group of games down here. There are more sandbox, she's, like she's the Sims. Just a, yes. a map and so, saying different So, like the Sims, this is all about the creativity. This is not about getting to any particular you know, place. This is about um, the journey here. So what you find here is, like, you know, there's psychological overlap. Where generally speaking, guys like these games, generally speaking, women like these games. And there's certainly overlap, but a really big mistake that our industry makes because it is such a sexist field is when this is all that's on the team, the this, is, score. this is all that gets represented. Why, this is why so many video games are so hard, are so impenetrable, and are so frustrating for new people to pick up. So, yeah, we have to talk about that different like psychology of different people. And the motivations, by the way, do not differ by gender, which is kind of interesting. It is sort of the style with which people are encouraged to play is part of what you're talking about. But you also seem to be talking about people who have grown up with a certain Sure. Group. So that means they already absorb all the assumptions. They know the language of certain kinds of games. Right. So that means it's going to be inaccessible for someone who hasn't spent 20 years learning. Yes, yeah? exactly. Just like candy, yeah. Yeah. But just like fiction, yeah, or art of any kind, I suppose. But yeah. And, 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 Oh, After you, by all means. No, no, I just wanted to add to the point that the games are also literally sexist. You know, like literal portrayal yeah, yeah. of, of where Grand Theft Auto. You know, like, you know, just like literally sexist too, which is also putting a barrier to, it's a non-entry barrier too. Yeah. So it's, it's something that, well, people like you are working on changing. It's yeah. a great personal cause. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. One, of, one of the most interesting experiments, and I do consider it an experiment that I ever saw come out of video games, was Doom. Because when Doom first came out, it was free. You just download it and play it. Uh, it wasn't as complex as it got later on, obviously. It was, it was a first-person shooter. Uh, but they also had patches that you could get for this. So you could download the game, and you could download an extra part to the game, again, normally for your cost, that completely and drastically changed it. My brother-in-law went nuts for that game because his idea of a good time was killing everything. So he would set it up so that he was indestructible and had endless ammo, and he would blow the crap out of everything for three hours and call it a day. But it, it's a legitimate approach. Then you had those patches. <laughs> so, yeah, one, exactly. of those, one of those patches turned it into aliens. Right. You literally could play the movie Aliens through Doom. And another one turned it into Barney. <laughs> so yeah, I gotta tell you, one of the creepiest Boy, Boy, Barney's yes. I've ever heard in my life is Barney in the middle of this labyrinth and maze, off in the distance, going, I love. <laughs> <laughs> There's no reason that should be scary, and yet, yeah. that's some creepy crap. <laughs> There was a there was a wad of uh, files you put in there, a little different than a patch, but the overall point, absolutely. So, yeah, um, I thought the the way that they monetized that game was very very interesting. It's interesting to see us kind of moving back to that in our industry with the uh, you know Kickstarter. It's very yeah. much yeah. Uh, this kind of crowdfunding idea for games. That's what Doom succeeded on. Is that what yeah. Yeah, 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 free to play. I think follows yeah. a lot of the same. Well, it, and, and actually, interesting how the apps business changed that. I mean, I used to love Freeverse. I'm a Mac guy from way back. Okay. And if you ever played, saw Freeverse games, they were basically freeware. Yep. You could pay whatever you wanted. And people paid. Right. And they kept going. They built some great games, Automatic, for example. And then they put out their first app for the iPhone, and they made more money from that one app in their first month than they had the entire history of the company. Uh -huh. And they said, we're not going to make Mac games anymore. Because you have the accessibility, being able to just do little bits and monetize it all, it was, it was too good. They just poured it over all their games. Yeah. Well, we could get into a longer discussion about Apple's abrogation <laughs> of the that too, game, but that's game platform. But yes, okay. I definitely agree with them. Okay, so 
We've talked about risk and reward. We've talked about accessibility. What other key things should you use to draw somebody into a game? Graphics. Okay. Pretty, pretty graphics is important. Interface. I would say yeah. interface is, yep. really, Actually, that's is, way is, is relevant to graphics. Interface it is so important, and UI engineers are so disrespected in our field, and they shouldn't, and they shouldn't be. be. That, is, that is where the real work happens. So what's really interesting about interfaces is, um, you know, you mentioned door fortress, right? This is terrible interface. The worst this in the world. This is bad, this is bad. But that communicates something on an artistic level to the player. It's ASCII code, so it's, you know it's going to be very obscure. Take the opposite of that, something like Candy Crush, where every single jewel is beautifully animated. And the UI is just built in a way to just keep you flowing through this experience. So yeah, I think graphics are a very, very, very key part of, um, of One of my favorite examples of that is The Seventh Guest. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. Fantastic. Okay, uh, which is, for those who aren't familiar, that is pretty much the first PC video game. Yeah. And again, one of my friends wrote that and paid for his house in Long Island off the first royalty check. More power to him. But the graphics in this thing were spectacular. I played that game the first time. I didn't give a rat's ass about any of the things I was supposed to be doing. I just wandered around this house going 360 degrees going, look at that. That's prettier than my real house is. Yeah. I'm going to go up these stairs because damn, I can. I was just thinking mist. Yeah. Because, because, you know, who cares if I can't figure out the puzzle? Look at this exactly. picture. Who cares about the puzzle? Yeah. Look at these things I can open. <laughs> Some of the guests also had voice, which I remember yes. being revolutionary when I first played it. And that gorgeous bass that, of that man saying, What? You beat me? Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> very satisfying. I'm stunned. I do feel strongly, though that our industry is very, very guilty of pursuing graphics at the expense and of so, your gameplay. So yep. look, at, look, <laughs> at, look at this next, this last generation stuff. You know, we have the PS3, which is, um, it's an iterative improvement on, we have the PS4, which is an iterative improvement on the PS3. We could be using that extra power for fluid simulation, for better AI, for better dialogue trees, for all of this really interesting computational stuff. And what do we waste it on? It's on particle effects, which right. are expensive, yeah. but that's what we do, and slightly higher texture values. Exactly, like little trends. And, and better lighting. And I have to agree yeah. with you, though, because yeah. you know some of the dialogue in these video games, I'm like, oh, for the love of God, 14 people have said the same thing to me. Yes, yes. <laughs> and they're using the same voice. Well, they do that, and then they procedurally rig the mounts up, so it just does this. Right. Yes. They won't pay someone to key it by hand. Our, our industry has a huge bias towards uh, you know automation, which is bad game design, in my yeah. opinion, because it breaks immersion. One of the stupidest yeah. examples that I ever saw was a version of, is the Monopoly. Now, yeah. I love computer game-based Monopoly, the original, the one I got from my Mac that played from Virgin Games, if you remember that. Oh my goodness. Because I could play a game in five minutes. Right. Which is, by the way, the way the professional players do it. Because they don't waste any time, you know, waste, they just count the money and go. They added animated graphics, so when you roll, it goes, Roll, 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 stop. Let's watch the shoe move around the board. And it's like, that's not why you play the game. Right. <laughs> Wrong. Yeah, so the graphics need to support the story. Would be, well, that's yeah. going to that's gonna have a function of making you feel immersed. And immersion is another technical term in games. Okay. It means so a very specific thing. Up. So I would argue that that does have a point, and that does build immersion and builds the emotional connection. So I would argue that's part of gameplay. Yeah. But but I'm saying, but do you use it properly? Like, say, for now, there's no problem. Right. Yeah, yeah. It no, it slows it, it down. Slows it down. Yeah. In, in a good in a good board game, immersion will help keep you playing and enjoying it, even if you know you're really going to lose. Right. right. So okay. it's our, pleasure to watch. It. Our 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 gaming group has a really bad track record with co-op games. I don't think we won pandemic once. Um, oh. Dead Dead Men Tell No Tales. We will play that for hours and hours trying to beat that pirate ship. I think we've won two games. I think so. Only one of those was our actual game. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's so much fun yeah. trying to do it. So let's flip this. We've talked about the graphics. What about the games that don't have the graphics? And I'm thinking of, say, for example, uh, Escape from Monkey Island. Yeah. Crappy graphics. Hey, it's not a great graphic. Well, okay, we're 
fine. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, All right, I'll take an extreme example. Anyone play Kingdom of Loathing? Sure. Yeah. You don't play it for the graphics. It's it's stick figure. You you literally. you play it for the graphics. The stick figure aesthetic. See, this is the thing. Like in 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 let's say impressionist art, they moved away from trompe l'oeil art. You know that was supposed to be the, the exact thing that you were seeing in real life depicted in two dimensional paint, and made it washier and pointillist and much more of a thing about how, how the eye works rather than how a thing might actually mimic another thing. And so Impressionism is probably worse graphics than 16th century Trump Louis art, but it was the next revolution in art. And I think now we are starting to get to the point where people can say, but the island is gorgeous, you know? And, and I've, I've read people talk, t writing about how much more difficult it is to create beautiful 2D art than it is uh, to, to take 3D art and, and make it in a different way because the expectations are different and, and creating fluid animation, say for like a 2D fighter, is, is a completely different aesthetic that has different requirements built into it. Okay, fair point, but I'm still gonna come back to Kingdom of Loathing, which is definitely crap art. No! The reason why you play- I would put that- Why do you play- Save the tooth play? lime on my chest, I want that t-shirt. But that's there's part of it. The joke is that yes, there's a saber tooth line in the game, so <laughs> and, and it is and it's brutal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, no, it freaking should be. <laughs> but the reason why I play that game is because it's hilarious and it's written well. The people who write it are grammar and language geeks, and it shows. And that's something you don't see in video games very often. Oh. Except when you do, I'm playing very a game, often. I'm, I'm playing a game called uh, Reigns right now. I just got it on my iPhone uh, two days ago, and it's basically. Uh, you have something like 1,300 years to kill about 60 kings to finally free your soul from the devil. And so basically you follow this timeline where all of these kings are hanged and burned at the stake and, you know, die in, in bacchanals with, you know, their own excess and things like that. And all in the meantime, it's this beautiful, beautiful interface. It's talking about elegant yeah. design. Yeah. The, the, the interface, it's a narrative, procedural narrative that is uh, tinder. Basically, you swipe left or swipe yeah. right. That is the only thing. Yeah. And by That's swipe, elegant. It, it is, but it's gorgeously done, and it's hilariously done. And it's, I, I actually think we're in a narrative renaissance right now. And I'm, I'm a reader, you know, and I'm a writer. And I think right now we are finding all sorts of really interesting narratives being discovered through things like Twine, which I know you know yeah. very well, yeah. and, and, and other sorts of mediums that are becoming democratized. And so what we're learning, though, I just want to get back to the idea of interface, because to me, it's very much a form follows function sort of thing, where if you make the right thing for your game, people will love it, no matter how simple it is. And so the saber tooth line works not only because of the writing, but because the drawing is a Shitty. It's shitty hilariously drawing. bad. It, it's it's hilariously bad, so it works for that. And and it works too in role playing games. You know, the character yep. sheet design is extremely important for where you're putting information, and the information flow of a character sheet is one of the things that will make or break a game. So. Well, and frankly, so is the artwork. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, a, a perfect example of that is I'm trying to remember the name of the system. I've been up for too many hours. Um. Basically, it's a riff on D and D, but whereas D and D used black and white artwork that wasn't very good. These guys actually paid artists to do really good artwork. Yeah. And took off like a bat out of hell. If you go to Gen Con, which um, I would do the Writers Conference, I'm going to this year, but I think I'm going to that. There's an I'm amazing sure. section of Artist Alley, and what they're doing is they're selling their art to all the people trying to design their games and getting Kickstarters done. Mm. So it's now become the point where people like, I've seen a few games where the art is magnificent and the game sucks, but totally it's beautiful, but it's interesting oh, yeah. to see how that kind of just pushing back and forth. I think that, I think we're seeing this a lot in indie games that, you know, like the perfect AAA game with Mass Effect, right? So great writing, great gameplay, yeah. great, yeah. great graphics, great interface, it's got everything. I think that if you're on an indie team, I think, your audience will let you slide on one or two of those if the rest are really polished and it does something else really interesting. So you, know, you listed a few games with really good gameplay. That is a case where the graphics are going to be forgivable in that point, but you can't just, it's not one or the other. Like all these aspects yeah. are important. Tell me those. Cheat a few of them. Tell me those four again. Sure, it's going to be graphics, interface, uh, it's going to be gameplay. Um, and you said writing. Writing, yeah, immersion. Yeah. Or all those core immersion. Yeah. 
Well, I would say immersion could be a combination of the writing and That's what I said, a technical yeah. gameplay term for writing is ah. immersion, and as far as game design goes. If you can't get lost in a story, you've done something wrong. Yeah, you yeah. failed. <laughs> or it's a different kind of game. I mean, well, yeah. why do people play Sudoku? Right? Think I mean, we know we're not talking about that kind of game. Right. But, well, know, think about sure. our arcade game. Well, maybe we are. Like, uh, Final Fight. Like, it's kind of a sexist game, but, you know, it's a very simple story. Jessica gets beat up, and you're going to rescue her, and you're possibly playing as the mayor right. who's a shirtless wrestler. That's a story. That's <laughs> like a, Hager. That is an immersive story that just happens to be told in a super different way. So that immersion is very yeah. high. Yeah. Now, one thing I thought I found, and I've only run across a couple of them, was, uh, an interesting start in video games that I don't really think went anywhere was when they took board games or um, tech, tactical games that were just amazingly slow mm -hmm. oh, and then yeah. put them in video game format, like Starfleet Battles. Oh, yeah. If you wanted to have a decent fight between more than one ship on each side in Starfleet Battles, you could be spending 45 or 50 minutes just setting everything up to make yeah. one move. Yeah. yeah. And then the video games came along, you're like, wow. Oh, I took care of an entire week in like an hour. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I want. We're almost done with our time, but I want to see if people have any questions because we have been barreling along here. Yes. Um, I'm just yes. sort of curious for um, Brianna. What is the uh, what's the best example of a game you've seen with bad graphics but good interface and gameplay, and the best a good, of a of a game with bad graphics but good gameplay? And again, with bad gameplay, but good graphics. <laughs> good graphics? Uh, you know, just take the last Call of Duty, right? Like, very derivative gameplay. Gorgeous graphics, great particle effects. I look at the the, the anti-aliasing dithering and transparency effects that game blows my mind. Uh, I would say something like, I'm sorry, I'm not a graphics nerd. I would say something <laughs> like Peckle. Peckle is a very under-celebrated game. I think it's a perfect game. I think it's a perfect piece of How game. How do you spell that? P E G G L E. Okay, that's what I thought. But you know, the, the graphics are just simple sprites, and the, the characters in it look freakish, <laughs> even though it's such a popular game. So, Poor yeah. Rappa the Rappa. Rappa the Rappa. And all the people who are oh, younger than the damn game, game and still go crazy. Oh, it's a great game. game. What are you talking yeah. about? Chop, chop, chop the exit to the bowl. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Not, right? Threes is a great game that just uses numbers very much like Sudoku or something yeah. like that. But Threes is, is just about perfect in yeah. terms of like, you know, just a, a beautiful experience that you can have on your iPhone. So that would be another one. Zero graphics really, it was just numbers. In fact, that I saw a presentation from the designer at, at a conference where he said he tried to make the graphics better and it ruined the game because, you know, it, it, did, what you, it did what you said where it was like the boot moving, you know, where yeah. you slowed down the experience. Yeah. I look at Pebble yeah. too, they tried to really up the graphics and they didn't pay attention to the gameplay at all. It's far worse game. Sorry, go Did guys from you guys any suggestions? Okay. I actually don't play video games as oh. much as I would love to because full time job <laughs> and full time writer. And every time I played a video game, I lost eight hours of my life. And well, yeah, shit, yeah. I can't write that. This is one reason I play King of a Clothing because I can only play so many turns and I'm done. There you go. There you go. Right, so I have two comments. First, I wanted to personally thank Mr. Moore. I have been playing White Wolf for 20 years. And some of my best friends are people who I have started playing White Wolf with. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So we have created crossovers, like we have created our own worlds in that system. So. And I think that's all the better. That's what you should be able to do with those things. Yeah, right. yeah a world of darkness. <laughs> so, Sorry, it's closed so, in the dark. So the question actually, so the, most of the panel had focused on the video games, right? I was mostly interested in the role playing games, right? Because White Wolf in particular was at the time when we started looking at it, which was what, mid 1990s or something, yeah, right? It was unique, right? In the sense that it felt real. They and did everything they could with White Wolf to make sure that that was the case. They wanted a nice, simplistic game system. They gave you the option with, with like player's guides to make it more complex. But they also, at, at the core, you didn't have to worry about anything. You grabbed a handful of the same set shaped dice, the math was easy, and you made your move. So it put the emphasis on role play. Exactly. It was far more important that you had characters that were realistic and that you could do things with. Especially, in, in, as an example, in Vampire, where the Machiavellian maneuvers were just preposterous. <laughs> And if you didn't do them right, you weren't going to be in that game for very long. Right. So the question had to do really with the 
kind of the thought process that went into the design, because that's a very different tack on design for role playing games than say AD and D or something else oh, like that. Yeah. So like, how did you guys go about this? Like what? It can't be just be play testing. There has to be a concept stage to this, which is different. Play testing was actually a remarkably small part about it. They wanted to make sure that the story ran okay, but. The big difference was that we're in with, with Dungeons and Dragons as an example. Normally what you had was, there's a castle over there. It's been abandoned for this many years. You should go in there and see what you can find out. A new evil has come from this castle. Go be heroes. Hmm. Whereas with a storyteller system, and that's what they called it, the storyteller system, the idea was you were writing an interactive story. So here's your setting. Here are the 75 important characters that are going on in this city right now and how they relate to each other. Here's the web that will show you how they will react with each other. Now throw your characters in the middle of that and hope you don't die. <laughs> because it's, again, the politics in those games was on a level that I don't think had ever been done in any, any game, period. Yeah. And that was three quarters of the battle. Give people the most immersive experience you can have sitting down at a table across from each other. Mm. And I think those kind of things also played up into the development of live action role playing games. Absolutely, they did. When I started in the, the days, the, the mid 80s, we were doing weekend long role playing games, and everybody had their character, and you had. A little lit figure. No, no, no. And we had three, the rule of three is what we used. You had to have three primary and one, one of those two secondary goals for this person. And then you said, off you go. I did a game designed on Watergate where Nixon wound up getting elected for a third term. <laughs> because... Well, a song about never saying never and never being told what you can or cannot do. This is one of us. A one, two, three. Or when fighting got to me I looked to find examples On the field of chivalry And I saw mighty arms Much stronger than my arms could ever be So I thought perhaps That field was not for me But still I stayed And watched the fighting Till one figure stood apart In armor newly fashioned And a helm more pot than art But each blow was thrown with honor And the lightness of the heart so I took that step which soon became a start Cause she was not the biggest fighter Nor one to raise a fuss But I remember being proud that she was one of us And we might never stand together In a shield wall side by side Because of her I lift my sword with pride She was ladylike and lively, not the type you would expect With a braver heart than many and a slot shot to respect And I guess she'd once decided this was where she'd like to be And I thought if she could do it, why not me? Cause she was not the biggest fighter, nor one to raise a fuss 